fascinating when two artists are a couple. Do you do you find anything unique about that experience? I don't know how you judge your own uniqueness. <laughs> <laughs> I like hearing about other art. I like hearing about art families. Yeah, you do? Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. And and why? What is it? I don't know, it's just nice to like imagine that environment, I guess. Like, um, I always was, one of my, our favorite artists is Meyer Kalman, and she mm-hmm. was married to Tybor Kalman, who was a great graphic designer. And I always liked it kind of like the trivia of their lives, like when they would do little projects that overlapped with each other. I mean, they worked with each other for a long time, and mm-hmm. Wayne White and Mimi Pond, I love that yes. documentary. And they have, their so kids good. are really good artists, and, and uh, it's interesting just to see how people, like, feed off of each other, and can be affected by each other but be different from each other and yeah I think it's very interesting yeah well how does that show up for you two you collaborate on projects together sometimes too sometimes I think it helps for me to be able to talk my work out and have someone actually understand what I'm talking about versus like if my husband had no interest or understanding about design than me complaining about a client or a project wouldn't be like his feedback would not be as helpful to me or you know help me troubleshoot the layout of something he's actually most recently he's actually done a couple of mock-ups for me for logos like when I'm trying to think of concepts I specialize in doing logos for her that her clients will reject (laughs) that's like the running joke now because he's done two and and they're really good ideas I think and then but then I make them my own and then the client never even goes for them because they like your ideas yeah that's because they I hired you like a, a good thing to have it, yeah. it is I put mustaches on everything you do <laughs> no oh, is that still happening the mustaches <laughs> I think it is <laughs> what would be another example and also you have two super adorable little kiddos Pink. and do you find that you're you're probably not thinking about it, but maybe you are thinking about how to involve them in a more creative life. Is it just happened naturally because that's your life or? I think people just assumed automatically, like when I was pregnant with Henry, our first, people just thought, oh, you're going to have this wildly creative little kid and they like set us up with all these art related baby books and really yeah like the baby shower my friends threw it was so sweet but it was all kind of like had this little picasso theme you know like you're gonna have this little genius and the first thing henry ever really showed an affinity for was drumming like it had nothing to do with art like they also thought we were gonna name our kids oh yeah they thought we were gonna name them some crazy zany name and it's henry thomas he's like very normal (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um so I think people have an expectation for us to have I'm trying to we don't have an agenda yeah an agenda exactly yeah that's not I don't have an agenda and I don't yeah but uh but if they want to do art then I get really excited I like making art with them and they're when they when Henry Henry when he was a little kid he broke his leg and and so he started drawing a lot during that time because he couldn't move around and we started drawing in a sketchbook together and that really inspired me and then I started taking my sketchbooks a lot more seriously because of the I started having a lot more fun in my sketchbooks because I was having so much fun in his sketchbook Mm. and uh, so it's fun to work together but he's a kid so they're they're both kids so they drawing to them is like playing Legos they could be doing anything it could be fun yeah, and I think for me, it's just one of the activities that I happen to be very good at leading, you know, so if, like, Meyer's bored, then, of course, it'll be one of the things that I suggest doing, like, oh, well, let's make a card, or let's get the markers out and do a drawing, but it's not because I'm trying to make her into this artist, or yeah. give them enough art time every day, or anything like that. hmm You bring up an interesting point, and especially since you were just telling me, too, you teach K through 8th grade. Mm -hmm. When does it stop, right? There's that that saying that when you ask a bunch of five-year-olds, like, who's an artist, everybody raises their hand. And then at some point, some people 
let that go. Have you noticed in your classes or through the different ages when some of that natural tendency to pursue art? I think it's always like around fourth, fifth grade. That's when you start to become self-aware, yeah, and you and yeah. you start to become critical, like of everything. You become critical of the way you look. You become critical of like each other. You become critical of your art. So, like my strategy with it is to give them such a strong foundation when they're not critical that when they get to that age, they will be less like they're like, well, he's good, but I also know how to do that, and and so hopefully they'll be less judgmental of themselves because they already have like a, a lot of skills um and i still have kids who are like in seventh grade and they're like well i can't draw and i'm like that's not true you drew the cover for the yearbook it's not <laughs> you know so yeah so it's always around that age you start to categorize yourself as like i'm the math kid i'm the pretty kid i'm the ugly kid i'm the funny kid so that's wild how that happens is that just a societal thing do we think or is oh, it just man. something that happens at that age? Yeah, it's a separate video. <laughs> <laughs> Probably there'll be a lot of those. More, more research than I've done. <laughs> just seems like it would be more of a biological. It's biological. Yeah. You become some kind of child yeah. development thing. Yeah. How did both of you make it through that in your in your own art when you were growing up? Well, I wasn't the artist in our family growing up. Like, I have two older brothers, and my middle brother, Ricky, was, like, the true, like, he'd been, he knew about perspective when he was five, kind of genius artist kid, and my older brother, I don't even know what he was really into, but for me, like, I enjoyed doing art, but I think because I knew that Ricky had the label, he's the artist, that even though I was good, and I specifically remember, like, uh, maybe it was fourth grade where we did like these self portraits and my teacher said oh yours is really good like I think she was very proud of me and I kind of was just like oh no it's not that good like <laughs> I just felt like how could I how could my art be that great I'm not the artist so it was your self-aware moment it was I think <laughs> it was my self-aware moment kicking in like I didn't identify as an artist until much later so it didn't and then there's really also, there's, apply. there's an interesting thing where sometimes really talented kids, really talented students don't pursue their art because they have such a good eye. Like they see things so well mm. that they're like, this isn't good. And I think Ira Glass did like a talk about it that's saying it's like your taste, that you have really good taste. Mm. Yeah. And there's an age where you have such good taste, but your skill doesn't match your taste. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I can see this isn't good, so I'm not going to do it. But, but I, th- oh, but I think, um, that's the taste is a skill. Being able to see that it's not good is a skill. And um, and you have to teach kids both. You have to teach them to see, and you also have to teach them to do. You have to teach them to teach their hand and teach their eye. Mm-hmm. And I think there's all the kids go through a stage where they, every artist goes through a thing where it's like, oh, I hate this. You know, this that artistic temperament. Even within a piece that yeah. you're creating. But I, I have it literally every drawing I do. It's like I finish it, I hate it. Everyone. Literally every one. I find something I hate about it, but I've gotten used to that rhythm of like, I did it. Oh, I like it. I like it. Oh, that's awful. And then I put it away and I look at it the next day and I look at it the third day and like when I do another drawing and then I forget what I hated about that one because I moved on to something else. But I think you have to teach kids to, and this is a separate thing, but just to be comfortable with not liking things, be comfortable with like messing up and, and... so. Does our eye develop quicker than our ability to execute what we're trying to create? I think it create? definitely does. But, I mean, if you think about it, you can go into a museum and you can say, that's a beautiful painting, I hate that painting. Your eye can see it, but your hand doesn't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. So, But I think there's interesting because there's some kids with really great taste right. who don't, who can really see that there's something off, there's something wrong, but they can't... Um, they don't pursue their hand. They don't like learn how to develop the so skill. So they get discouraged in the moment that they that that connection isn't happening, and they stop. Yeah, but I think I think maybe there's kids who develop really well because they aren't judgmental of themselves. They're mm-hmm. just afra- they're just not afraid they just to keep take. Doing it anyway. Yeah, they just keep doing it and keep doing it, and and they develop. But you can work with both those things. So, so do you think everybody has the aptitude to draw? I think if you can write, then you can draw. Really? Mm-hmm. And it, 
in class, are you able to teach people how to access that? Well, almost everybody. Really? Sure. I well, you did go to school for it. Uh, you studied. Well, sort of, I did. I <laughs> I really learned how to teach from from another teacher when I was teaching at another school. At school, it seems like they don't actually teach you like this is how you do it. But I was teaching at another school, and his he taught you how to teach. Like he said, that you say it this way. You stand here. You do this. You phrase it like this. You know, and which really helps. So there's a skill just to be able to teach somebody how to access that part of their brain or because I am self-taught and I took classes, but I never, I wouldn't even know. I don't really know how to teach someone how to see the way I see or how to make the mark the way, you know, obviously I'm better suited to show someone how to access that in themselves, but to do the actual skills because Mm -hmm. your, um, your illustrations are amazing. When I look at what you're doing with it being so realistic, but also having some of the comic side to it, I don't Mm -hmm. even know how to begin to execute something like that. Yeah. I can definitely teach that. You can, Mm -hmm. you can teach it. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. Camera's off. I want to learn. (laughs) You were saying that you didn't see yourself as an artist because some of the drawings that you do as well, you have that similar skill. So do you learn from each other or how did you develop that? Um, I don't know. (laughs) I've taken art classes here and there. And then definitely since being married to Rama, I think I have maybe, I don't know. He hasn't sat down with me and taught me. Things, but I think just one thing that he has taught me is maybe like just perseverance with a single project, whether it be like a drawing or not even perseverance, but just finishing it. Like, because <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I'll have that self awareness, like in the middle of an illustration, um, and I'll just feel like, oh, it doesn't, I messed it up. It doesn't look like what it's going to look, what I thought it would look like. And I want to start over. Or I, I want to pick a different subject. <laughs> like, I've done that for. Like art shows that we've been in um, we'll be side by side and I'll be talking like this to him and he always says just finish it <laughs> like see it through and then you'll see that it will look like what you're drawing or what you're trying to draw and he's almost always right like it it always looks better once I put all the work into it and the detail into it and so I think just having that partner to like help push me toward it has helped but um, my brother Ricky was like my first art teacher. He he actually did sit down and teach me like the proportions of the face and how to draw certain things. Garfield. <laughs> he taught me how to draw I Garfield. Think I did. That's an important Garfield. Step. That's an important step. Garfield's an important step. Garfield's an important step. Fifth grader. Like, I did I think quite I gave a few Snoopies. <laughs> many greeting cards with Garfield and a slice of pizza on it. I actually, I fantasize sometimes that she'll go to art <laughs> school just because I think she'd enjoy it so much. But I also, when I mention it, she, she gets reluctant because she does have her own voice already. And, and there is a lot of, a lot of in school where you kind of have to like mimic your teacher yeah. and, uh, and it would suck for her to lose that. But it, it would be fun just to see her go through and, and learn all like the really technical mm-hmm. things. I think I, I think about that too sometimes. What would it be like to go? Because right. I, well, I shied away from it because I didn't think I could make a living. Okay, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> Yay. And the other part is I, w- I got intimidated. Mm. I had some early experiences where my natural ability wasn't fostered in the way I needed it to be. Mm-hmm. And I just... Even taking classes in college, I did a few of them, but I felt like people were so much better Mm -hmm. than I was, and I just thought, well, how would I compete with that? And then I came out of school and ended up working immediately as a graphic designer, which is kind of a nice transition into trusting your voice, because it's your eye. Maybe that's exactly what you're talking about. You're you have you start to develop your eye and then you have the time within that process to right. develop the skill a mm-hmm. little bit yeah maybe that's how it happens yeah i feel like art school does sound fun sometimes but i feel like at this point in my life i would just be paying for 
the extra time, like just that de- time to really devote yourself. And you already have a community. To and you a project or to like learning a yeah. skill. And that sounds great. Like to take like a month or two and not worry about money and just yes, draw nice. all the time and like look for inspiration and <laughs> stay up all night and keep drawing and making things. That sounds great. And, um, but I do think like having, yeah, a teacher or someone telling me what to do or how to do things. I think because I have such a, like an art director role in so many of my projects, that would be hard for me to take at this point. If I went back to school, I know career. I would just ignore almost all the assignments. <laughs> you would. I, I respect school, but I think I am at the point where I don't want anyone telling me what to right, do. Right, so I don't think it would be great. But I do enjoy taking classes. Like, I love... Like, I love all the workshops, you know, that there's so many workshops and opportunities right now to take, to, like, build up skills here and there, and I want to keep doing that. Yeah. Because I've, it's helpful and it's fun. Yeah, I think I took my first painting class just a couple of years ago. Just a That's short amazing. one at one of the retreats. Oh, yeah. And I, <laughs> everyone else was had so many classes, I'm like, I'm a professional artist, and this is my first painting class, <laughs> I didn't want to be influenced, and I felt intimidated, and it's worked out fine, but now I realize why people also enjoy them so much, right. and it's totally, well, for me, it's very, any class is very much dependent upon the teacher, and, you know, having a safe space when you're creative is yeah. huge, whatever discipline you're working in. Mm-hmm. I think I was starting to ask you, but I don't know if you answered the question about when did you recognize that you had a talent and that you kept pursuing it, mm-hmm. that you didn't stop? Um, well, I don't like that word talent. I, like, I, I like okay. a lot of philosophy about that. <laughs> but, um, Ooh, well, will feelings. you tell me for a second? Please tell me. I just think that talent is just interest. Okay. When do you realize that you have an interest and oh, did you pursue good. your interest? All right, I can um, get behind them. <laughs> yeah, and then I think interest becomes talent. If you if you uh-huh. pursue your interest, it'll become a talent. Okay. So, but my whole family are all artists, and so it was just something that we did, and um, and I just felt like I would do it no matter what, whatever I ended up becoming. And then, <laughs> so, yeah, and then I guess I decided to go to art school because my brother went to art school, and I was so impressed with his artwork and just wanted to do artwork like that and but I didn't really have an agenda I just wanted to keep following my interests so here I'm gonna remember that (laughs) I'm glad you shared that with me that's good I I was not a good artist compared to the people in my art school I definitely when I got there I was like the smart kid I wasn't the talented kid it was (laughs) there were a lot of amazing artists and I was like I didn't know how to do anything that they knew how to do and I think I spent a lot of time just working and working and working because I could see how much better everyone was than me. So. And by working, is that sketching? Yeah, just drawing all the time. Drawing all the time, yeah. yeah. I have a friend, Shannon, who teaches art, and she said she likes like my story of <laughs> art school because when I arrived, I was noticeably not good. And when I left, I was noticeably good. And, and she like wanted to show my sketchbooks to show that it was just like work get there so (laughs) yeah I think well that's a separate conversation too a lot of people because we see so much on the internet people don't really want to put the time in that it takes to develop your skill or develop your interest like you're saying I think also like that feeling of insecurity when you see that there's other people who are really good yes with drawing in particular or anything like you see like like, the first example that comes to mind is, like, I have very half-assedly been trying to learn how to play the trumpet. and and <laughs> But now when I hear people play the trumpet, I feel, like, sick. Like, oh, my God, they're so good. I'm never going to be that good. Um, so what's the point? But I don't really feel like that. What's the point? Because I know, like, the key to learning anything is you got to suck at the beginning. Like, that's if you want to do it, you're going to be really bad at first. And then you just have to be willing to be bad. 
and as you get better. And so I feel like if you're surrounded by people who are really good, that's great because they can make you feel jealous and sick and want and, and aim <laughs> and for these something. Are good feelings. Yeah, those are the feelings <laughs> that say. Yeah, if you feel jealous, that's the feeling of I want that too. Yeah. I want to get there too. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that that awful feeling is like I really really want that, you know. So go for it. Oh, that's nice. I like that one too. <laughs> I was thinking about it because I've been going back to dance and just feeling so much like, oh, I can't get my, you know, my mind and my body to, I want it to look like the teachers. <laughs> and what am I thinking? I mean, they're <laughs> trained from the time they're tiny and, the, you know, they'll just like go like this with their arm and it's beautiful. <laughs> and it's this constant reminder. I love when you said that, that you just have to be willing to suck at something. I think that's important to share because so many times we don't pursue anything because of that simple. Yeah. I see, I've seen people in my life multiple times where they just stop because there's always this moment, there's a decision that you make where you decide, I'm going to keep going with it because I do want it that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you were in school and you saw this happening, how did you keep going with it and not? stop at that moment I don't know I, I I think I could feel myself getting better so that's that's rewarding I think just to see yeah. your own progress well one of the questions I have for both of you whoever would like to go first is how did you decide to pursue creativity in a profession hmm. I always had the pull toward art but um, like I said I didn't feel like it was my place and so um, the other thing that I was really good at was writing, and so I decided to pursue that instead because I thought I could make money. Um, it was a steady career to be um, a journalist rather than an artist or what I had thought I might be. One of the things that I was pulled toward was like being a children's book, like making children's books. Um, but it's like, oh, I heard voices in my head, and I think adults around me just saying you know you might not make money doing that so I think it was just I was pursued journalism and I was good at it and I um, edited the paper and then I got a job as a community reporter and then it was just that first year of like being employed as a community reporter where like I think my soul was just being kind of sucked dry because it was just not interesting and not it wasn't feeding me at all and and that's, I switched to um, a magazine company doing web stuff because that was the time when the internet was just starting to be accessible to all of us. And I discovered these websites um, where people were just like sharing their writing and photos and I, that seemed a little more creative and, and so I pursued that instead and I think just slowly I just kept, even though I thought I wasn't going to ever do art for a living, it just crept up on me because I, it, it's just a part of me and I couldn't escape it and it's what made me feel good and happy and productive and doing it for a living was just once like I started doing it more and more on the side while I was working as a web producer. Um, people were started to actually find me and approach me to help them where I realized like oh I actually have like a skill <laughs> like a marketable skill to get paid to design for people and and then once other people it took me to see other people taking me seriously to take myself seriously I think and then I realized that I could maybe be a professional artist like a designer for a living and is that when you decided to go freelance or was yeah, that yeah it was like so I'd been working I had been working at that company for the magazine company for I think five years and I started to have more and more jobs on the side and where I realized like oh I could maybe do this and it helped to I think Ram and I had just been dating for a little bit so he like opened my eyes to like this world of freelance illustration because he was doing illustration at the time um, and then my friend Sabrina, she was like a working artist. I think I just also started to have these people in my life who were working artists who were telling me like, you can do this. Like I, 
You, it's really helpful. It, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, one of the and, reasons I'm doing this. Well, one of the things, yeah. I mean, that stuck with me, too, was that um, right before I left, I was offered, like, more money to stay. Like, a lot more money than I thought I to would ever make like. to do a job that I don't like. And I was really tempted. And I remember Sabrina told me, um, like, yes, you could be making more money, but your quality of life will not be, like, as good. And I think that really, like that was the clincher for me because at the time I was not loving life at all like I was just the job that I was working at started to drag on as well and I just knew that I could take a pay cut and pursue something that would make my heart happier and see where it led me and I did it knowing that maybe it wouldn't work out I just kind of was like I saved enough money and I quit my job and I thought maybe it'll only last me for three months and at least I will have tried and then I can go get another full-time job somewhere if I have to. And thankfully, I never had to. It just transitioned pretty smoothly. Um, yeah, I mean, freelance. it was a very slow, like, it was a slow, not, what's the opposite of decline? A slow progress. Incline. Yeah, <laughs> slow incline. Um, the progress was slow, I think, because I was, like, we got married and then had Henry pretty soon after that, and... So I feel like I would make progress and then maybe it would just like slow down and then I'd make a little more progress and then it would just like slow down or go backwards a little. And um, I feel like I'm finally at this point where I can see that I'm just like... She's doing better than I ever did. Progressively getting better and better each year, maybe just in the past couple of years. That's exciting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how did you make the decision, Rama, to pursue creativity and then you also chose education within that world yeah I, two of your questions I realized I don't think I'd make a lot of decisions <laughs> I, I think then my life just kind of unfor- unfurls and I just kind of go along with it and that is a way <laughs> that is a way yeah as just... long as you're happy it works for you yeah I looking back on it it seems like a very straight path but I don't think I made a lot of choices I think. so how did it unfurl for I you? just um in school when I was in high school I just really liked art and I couldn't I didn't really think I'd make a living at it but I couldn't imagine studying something else you know I didn't really nothing else really sounded fun to me and um so so I went to art school and then when I was in art school the question was always like how are you gonna make a living and yeah. I was like I don't know <laughs> um but illustration uh, and I actually I didn't even try I went to work on a farm and and uh and and then at the farm um, while I was doing farm work, the farmer asked me to draw something. I frequently got asked to draw things, and and I was like, "Well, this is better than shoveling manure." <laughs> <laughs> so, <is> literally, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so, <laughs> so then I left the farm. I tried to be an illustrator, and it, like I was lucky and got some work right away. And then, so for like ten years or something, I was doing illustration. And then, uh, and just wandering around the country and getting other jobs to support that. And, uh, and, but to me, it wasn't super satisfying. Like, I like drawing, but I didn't like illustration. For clients. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, so there was always, like, just some kind of vague desire to do something else. And, and I did always like teaching, and, and I was like, I did go to study teaching for a year, and, and, uh, when I was in college, and so I'd take little teaching jobs, and Christine actually was the one who, like, was like, why don't you teach art? And it didn't occur to me. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I do. I like, I like teaching, and I like art. Yeah, I could do both. So It seems like you have been good for each other. Yeah. <laughs> that you have been a nice yeah. example of, like, a beautiful support system. Oh, and that you also, yeah, yeah, nice work. That you also listen to each other. Or you sort of go, hey, yeah, maybe you're right about that. Right. <laughs> well, it is, it's mm-hmm. an evolution, the whole, I, I mean, it is. I think that's part of it. You have to stay open because we don't. As creatives, we don't have a clear path. No. There just isn't one. I mean, now, what would you tell, or what do you, will you tell your children today? If, let's say they do want to pursue the arts. I imagine that you'll say, hey, yeah, go for it. You'll figure it out somehow, or... 
I think it's always scary to tell, ask that question in terms of what will you tell your children? Because that's not your true wisdom. I think when you tell your children anything, it's like, tell from your deepest, darkest, scariest place, what would you say? So what would you, that be? You, you want your kids to be safe and, and take the safe choice. That's what you want for your kids. Right. You want them to be protected and, and be safe. Like, but, what, but that's not real. That's not true. You want your kids to be brave and do and things like that and be confident and capable and follow their heart. But I think when you say what, you, if you say what would you tell a student, <laughs> okay, then that's one thing. But if you say what would you tell your kids, you'd say play well, you it can safe. Tell me both. <laughs> you like science too, don't you? Yeah. You're, a You're really good at math. Yeah, engineering. Is, I hear is, attorneys are. <laughs> yeah. I'd be really proud if if our kids were engineers. But but um, <laughs> no, I think. I know that there are so many more professions available to artists than any artist is ever aware of in school. And that's a big thing that I want to impart to my students is if this is your interest, there's more for you to do with these skills than you could ever imagine. Take everything that you are interested in, if it's art and science and history and all that kind of stuff, those divisions are imaginary. Those divisions only happen in school. So if you want to do this, there's so many things out there for you to do. Just cultivate your skills and something's going to fall into place for you. So That's nice. That's what I would say. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know what I would say versus what I wish I would say, (laughs) but what I would like to impart is that, um, that it, nothing is permanent because I think I was really plagued with that decision when I was, you know, in high school, like, what am I going to major in? Like, this is the rest of my life. life, And I think I just hope that I have the wisdom to, to let them know that, you know, if they do decide to not pursue art or if they do decide to pursue art, then that's great. And they can start out there and see where it takes them and try to find one of the careers. I think that's really important, even just not to think of any thing as a path yeah i'm not getting here to get there yeah because so much whether you're an artist or anything else how do you enjoy or not enjoy doing client work because you were talking about that earlier and i know for me that was a very conscious decision of because i had done graphic design interior design Mm. and when i started to pursue something on my own i realized i don't like doing it Mm -hmm. i think it depends upon obviously who your client is right, and if course. it's or any collaboration for that matter if it's exciting and you see things in a similar way mm-hmm. but for me one of the best parts of doing the work I do is to create something and love it so much just for me right and to put it out in the world and have it sell and have someone love it equally there's just nothing better mm-hmm. so how do you handle working with clients or do you enjoy it do you find it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> to all my clients, pick no. the wrong job <laughs> to get good at. Um, no, I actually I do like it. I think um, for one, I enjoy the kinds of clients that I work with because they're small businesses, like people pursuing their dreams, like opening a shop or pursuing my photography full time. And so, for the most part, um, they're people that you know are at the beginning of their creative journeys or just business journeys and to have them come to me tell share their story and say like how do I tell that story to the world and make them want to care about what it is that I'm also doing and so that is super gratifying to me and um and it's fun and I think having of course there's always clients that you know you don't see eye to eye with and I think every graphic designer, every person who works in some kind of client work has like an arsenal of like bad client (laughs) stories where you didn't see eye to eye or you didn't get paid on time and you know, there's frustrations here or there. And I think part of maybe my growth as um, a business person is like coming to a place where like you can find the right kinds of clients. So I think now I'm at a place where I can say, I don't think we're a good fit, like, or no, I'm and not able eight. to take this project. And, and that makes all the difference because you know, like you have this, yeah, you that's can what hear. I wanted to ask you. You're able to sense that now. Quicker. Oh yeah. Like for sure. Like I, my gut, you feel like, I feel like you a sinking <laughs> feeling right away when I'm reading their really? words. It's just like, 
oh, they're asking something that's like kind of impossible or ridiculous or, or they, they have no vision, they, they have, have no, no budget, vision or they have no budget. <laughs> and, and you know, that I want all of these people to succeed, but I'm not the person to help them succeed. Cause I also, people who don't have budget, like I have a business and I have a family, like I'm trying to support them. So we're not a good fit for the project. Like maybe yeah. they can build it on their own first and come to me when they can afford something. And so I think like, yeah, it's part of, um, the reason why I think I can still do it is because I'm finding better fits and like able to have better client relationships and I'm learning more how to communicate. What would be just an <laughs> example of that? Cause I've been thinking lately that I mean, the way that we do everything <laughs> with writing and how it can be misconstrued right. with email and even texting. I mean, lately I've just been picking up the phone and talking yeah. to people because I don't want to think that much about how to craft something to make sure it's coming across clear. Right. And I understand we need those things sometimes for documentation. Right. Yeah. But what are you figuring out within that process? What? Well, something that you're finding helps the communication oh, process. Well, I think like... For example, if I give some, if I'm presenting like my first round of designs, I explain, you know, why, why it is I came up with these ideas and what my thinking is behind them. Because I think sometimes um, people will see something and won't realize that a lot of thought went into why I picked these fonts or these colors and why the graphic is the way they it is. I think they just think we're just drawing, like having fun, like doing these little doodles. And that's not really the case. And so having my like um explanation and then I have like a little spiel that I give about like the kind of feedback that I that's helpful so it's like please don't tell me like um to make the, like to it's basically called prescriptive feedback where it's like please don't tell me what to do tell me what you're feeling or what like um the feel like what you feel overall needs to be get done and I'll figure out how to do it oh, if that makes sense yes. so it's like <laughs> that's you really open clear. up this design and it's like oh it doesn't feel bright enough don't mm -hmm. tell me like can you please add some yellow oh, and wow. some white and some purple here and do that in there because then we get into this like fish this awful cycle of me just like not even thinking about the problem and so I'm not picking the right solution necessarily for the for what the problem is that's so if they tell me what the good. problem is then me as the expert, as the person who's been doing it longer can say, okay, I can see that you want more color and you think that making this whole thing yellow is going to make the design better, but it's really going to blind us all. Like what we should, you know, strategically let's do this and this instead. And then, and I found that that's been huge. And that's really so, good. and those are the kinds of things that like I've learned from other designers that like from building my own community of designers and programmers and because these are things that I would never would have figured out on my own so I think community becomes huge yes also. that's something that's come up a few times and yeah something we're working on building more of yeah right now yeah, yeah. for sure no, it's, we can't do this alone and right. many of us work alone and we just have to be able to reach out to people mm -hmm. for help with all of that yeah well and for you Rama when you well, <laughs> I won't ask you if you made a decision. Mm -hmm. When you un <laughs> unfurled away from client work, you mentioned that it wasn't your favorite. Is there? Yeah, I think when it, when I started, it was like trying to work as an artist. It was I would jump around. I'd be so happy that I got an assignment. But I think it was yes. really just like the approval. Like I, I just love the approval that someone <laughs> would, would pay me to do my art, and that was the joy I got from it. And then as I stopped needing the approval it started to be more like I got into like a real rhythm with freelancer it'd be like you work and work and work and then you have your dry spell like everybody has like work spells dry spells you need work 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 and you make enough money to like set you up for a few months and then you're not so worried about work and you start working on your own project and you you're working on your own thing and I'm really happy working on my own thing and then I get a client calls with an assignment and I'm like oh shit I gotta <laughs> go back to work I guess and um and so I would have that feeling a lot. But um, 
And is that because it's similar to what Christine is saying, where the client may not fully understand what you're trying to express, or... No, I think it was just I liked drawing without someone telling me what to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, but I like it. That, yeah. I totally understand that. <laughs> yeah, and there are certain clients who I could, like, like I maybe, like, three clients who I felt like we never became friends or anything, but I felt, like, very friendly towards them, because whenever they called me, I would happily do anything that they wanted yeah. me to do because I felt like they knew who I was and they knew what to expect and they usually called me because they knew I would like that thing mm-hmm. um, and they were right they'd just call and see like oh it's this and I'd get really excited and, yeah. and want to do that but um, but I think the truth is I wasn't really suited to being an illustrator and I think that was kind of a failure in my own education that I was going through school and there were certain tracks set out for me. Like, you can do this, or you can do this, or you can do this. And I was like, well, I guess I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was never cut out for business at all. And I was never... Um, and I really, I just like drawing. Like, that's it. And, and a lot of... There's a lot more to illustration than that. And, uh, and um, so I think I kind of picked it because it seemed doable. And it was, to a certain extent. But I wasn't loving it. And... Um, and it didn't and I had my nightmare client stories and I had really great client stories Mm -hmm. and I also think that working with a good art director even if you don't enjoy it can be an amazing experience Um, Mm -hmm. and I compare it to George Lucas a lot my friends and I were just talking about this that when George Lucas wasn't a bajillionaire he made really good movies because he had to answer to somebody Mm -hmm. and he had to craft his art to suit an audience and made his work better and then when he was on his own and set loose to do anything he wanted, he kind of made movies that people don't like so much. And I still like them. But but it's still, <laughs> like, if you have someone there whose job it is to make your work better, your work will get better. And I, and I think that's the value of having a good art director. But not all art directors are good. And, and sometimes even if it's a really good art director, you can drive yourself crazy trying to make them happy. Mm. And, um, yeah, that is one notion, I think, we forget is that having parameters can be really good for you Mm -hmm. to succeed within. And there are, I've had experiences where I worked with someone and I was like, wow, this is really amazing because of them. Like they took what I had and they made it a better thing. Yeah. So, well, when I partner with companies now on more of a licensing side or doing the fabric design, I've been lucky to have some experiences like that where you just think, oh, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know when I it's, I guess it's really simple when it's the right fit, which is what you're saying. Right. Then it makes everything better. It really does. Everybody becomes better right. in the situation. And if it isn't the right fit, and this doesn't just apply to art again either, then you know it's wise to figure out how to. I, well, it's almost. I'm thinking as I'm saying this, it's imp- it's equally as important to develop your skill of your talent or what becomes your talent, mm-hmm. your interest, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> as it is to develop people skills in this whole process because that's it's so important. Mm-hmm. And it only, I think the only way that that happens is through time. Yeah. Well, I think you're talking about your own interest again. My own interest. About yeah. people skills. That's an interest of yours. Yeah, it is. Right. But, there, <laughs> but not all artists have that interest, oh. have that desire. And that doesn't make them worse artists for not wanting to interact with people. That's true. There are a lot of... <laughs> A lot of amazing <laughs> artists who are reclusive by nature, and That's yeah. true. and um, and and some of them are some of the best artists I can think of. And and uh, if they're lucky enough to have someone who World takes their handle. work out of the world, that's yes. great. But still, they might be doing amazing art in their basement, you know. And it doesn't diminish the art that they're doing, just that it's not in Seventeen magazine or whatever, you know. Like it's yes. still really amazing artwork. No, you bring up a really good point around that because. I am I like I love this idea. It's re I'm reframing my brain a little bit about <laughs> your interests. I mean that is where I'm thinking totally from an entrepreneur business side. Right. You have to have that, otherwise that makes it really difficult. Mm-hmm. And if not, then you have to have somebody who will be that person for you. Right. Did you ever have a rep when you were doing illustration work? No, I didn't. <laughs> I was always scared of reps because I felt like then I then I need to take all this work. If they start getting me work, then I need to take all this work. And, and then I'm stuck doing all this awful work. <laughs> well, ideally, you have a rep that understands That the you kind don't of want work. too much work. Well, that you don't want too much <laughs> and the kind of work that you want. Right. I've seen it become really 
like a beautiful thing with I people. Have too, yeah. But I've heard, yeah, bad experiences too. So it's just another one of those like, does it work for you in the way that you want to work? Yeah. Well, it this what you're you have to describe it for me again. But this what you're talking about this idea of picking what interests you, right? Mm -hmm. Am I saying it right? And developing your skills around that. That just changes everything. Mm -hmm. Because when you're, when you're saying, you know, for me, people and understanding people and even talking to people, that's something that I'm passionate about too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like you're also saying, it may not be for someone else. Like imagine what would our lives look like if we really took every aspect of what interests us like what you're saying and really develop something around that it's pretty profound <laughs> i think it <laughs> it's is overwhelming. yeah yeah it's really profound but i think it's a moment to moment kind of thing yeah like, that you know, your interests are going to change and that's true and i don't think it's like again I, I mean i have a huge especially as an art teacher one of the reasons i like being an art teacher yeah. is that i don't um feel like art is limited to a career i feel like art yeah. is just a part can just be a part of your life. Yes. So evaluating your art based on your career, it, it's like it's just two separate. It's two separate things. Yes. And if you want to make it your career, then you have all these other parameters that you have to develop. Like I'm interested in making art my career, so you have to develop that those skills. But if you're just interested in making great art, that's very that's much easier. You don't right. you don't have to develop your people skills, and you don't have to yeah. learn how to do your taxes, and you know it's. <laughs> It's, well, you might have to learn that. Well, you don't have to learn. You don't have to learn to make your taxes for your paintings. You know, you, you just make your art, and you draw mm-hmm. in your sketchbook, and you have you know your own relationship with your art. Just set it, up your basement studio. Set up your basement <laughs> studio. Well, what was that that documentary that came out about that woman who took pictures of the, like all of the 1950s? It just came out like oh yeah. That to me, that's an enormously mm-hmm. beautiful work of art that had nothing to do with selling anything. It had nothing to do with fame or popularity. She just wanted to see. She just wanted to see her world, and that's it. And it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's as powerful as my it favorite is. illustrator. You know, maybe more. So to go back to your point, this idea that we often think our interests have to become our career. Yeah. And how how do you ultimately separate that out just because you are interested in it even if you want to develop your skill within it it mm-hmm. doesn't have to be your career so taking taking your work and putting different parameters around that which i think is what you're saying that's another interesting element to that whole concept mm-hmm. yeah i think that there's a lot of like judgment in our society about about that about like pursuing your dream and what your yeah. career is yeah. and and yeah, i mean will it's, you it's talk to me about that those are my favorite stories. People kind of just find a life that fits for them. Yeah. And uh, I know for me personally, like where I'm at right now, I don't know if I'll feel this way in five years, but I love where I'm at right now because I can take my skills and my talent and whatever that is, and I can bring it to a bunch of kids and share that with them during the day and then get revved up to go home and do my own thing and not owe um, my art time to a client that I can come home and I can just draw my family and that's, I get to make something that I really care about and I get to share my skill with somebody. I think that gets into the idea also, though, that, that your interest is your career. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, that's yeah. not just, that's Telling just not that necessarily too. true. Right. In that your your interests can be free-floating, you know, and you can still cultivate them without them being right. your identity. And I think just like you said, where now you come home and you come a lot, like, you get excited to draw. And I think... That's where sometimes I feel jealous of him because he's like drawing for fun where I'm doing something for somebody else again. And so it's like when your interest does become your job, then you don't necessarily get to pursue it as an interest. You don't get to enjoy your interest. You don't get to enjoy it in the same way or enjoy it at all. Like there are times where I'm just like, oh. I can't make anything anymore, you know? Like I'm just I felt that way too. And, and, me 10 years ago was like leaving work like I cannot wait to go home and make something and I will stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning making this thing because I'm so into it and so it just shifts and that was actually what I was going to say earlier that Harvey Picar uh-huh. if you know who he is he's the comic book artist who did American Splendor that he worked as a file clerk in a hospital in Cincinnati for his entire life <laughs> and then he made a comic book a very successful very famous comic book in his spare time and received enormous accolades and and just extremely well respected and i think they even made a statue of him in cincinnati like 
because of his art, but that wasn't his career. His career was he was a file clerk. And to the point where then when he retired, he was going to, like, I'm going to do my art full time, and then he just died. You know, like, his, his file clerking was what gave him all this inspiration for his work. You know, it was autobiographical. He interacted with all these different people. There was a huge component to his success was that he was, he was a real person in the world interacting with people mm-hmm. and I know when I was doing art it was like, inf- like just doing illustration at my most successful I was the most lonely it was just you know I was just oh, wow. working in my room getting emails working all day going out in the midnight to eat at 7-eleven <laughs> or whatever you know it was, it was like wow I'm really successful <laughs> this is terrible <laughs> <laughs> it's never what you think it's gonna be and I I sometimes fantasize about having yeah, some other kind of job that has nothing to do with art and trying to find that place again. I don't know. Yeah. It's strange. Well, it's As you're talking about it, I realized that for me, I did it this weird way where as I started to develop that interest and the skill, mm-hmm. it started to grow as a business. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't even know if I've been able to fully explore just doing it for fun. Mm. And I certainly, as much as I... I do, I get so much joy (laughs) making a painting, but it's very difficult now for me to separate, will this match a series, will, would, a lot of my work goes into kids' rooms, and Mm. are these the colors that people are using, and being able to balance both sides of, boy, this really gives me so much enjoyment, and how can I make sure that the business commercial side of this doesn't overtake that? Mm -hmm. Because many times it's like, well, why did I start all of this to begin with? (laughs) Maybe that interests you. Maybe that is... (laughs) Rama, I keep (laughs) discovering new things. Wait, about myself, what interests me? Well, the The first time I ever met you, I was on the downward slope of illustration where I was like, I'm over this. Was this when we all did the girly show? Yeah, I think it was at six or something. I was like, I'm sick of illustration. I don't want to do this anymore. I was starting to teach art. Dad was like, I was excited to do that. And you were asking me questions, just general curiosity about business. And I was like, (laughs) oh. (laughs) <laughs> but now what it's 10 years later and you're it still is. interested maybe you're interested in the business of art Andy, War- Andy Warhol was interested in the business of I art. I am I definitely am and yep. I'm interested in teaching it too yeah I yeah. definitely I enjoy all aspects and I think that is a challenge for me and mostly I love it but I think you know another intent with this series is to be able to say no it it often isn't what we think it is right and I don't know um if we really addressed it I know you did a little bit but your thoughts on this idea I'm feeling slightly cynical to the idea of following mm-hmm. your dreams mm-hmm. in a way that I didn't used to and maybe it's just because it's it's everywhere and that is good and I <laughs> don't want that mm-hmm. to be misunderstood in any way but part of what I keep saying within these conversations is what happens after this, to me, this is the conversation we should start having because there's so much more opportunity and that's very exciting for everyone. But if you're really not thinking about everything we've talked about today, your true interest, what you're skilled at or even interested in developing more skill at, does that really fit? in terms of at least let's just say a career Mm -hmm. in your life or or does it fit in your life because we can ask ourselves all these questions now we have so much more opportunity Mm -hmm. i think that goes back to what christine was saying that nothing is permanent i think you have to be free it's like you said it's really cool that people have internalized pursue your dream yes that's wonderful (laughs) i think people i think maybe the next step is to internalize that you're free to change. You, yeah. Changing is okay. And, and and maybe your dream one year is yeah, I'm going to do this and your dream is going to morph and, and mature, I think. Um, and I do think maybe the whole pursuing your dream thing is it's so premature that people have dreams when they're a kid and your parents project, I'm just going to be a drummer. That's yeah. your dream. <laughs> right. You know, like, oh, he's really into art. You're going to be an illustrator. That's one you can make money at. Yeah. And yeah. you don't realize, oh, you know, there are, there's... There's a spectrum of things I could do here, and you might not even see it until you're, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 years old. You, you know, but yeah. I think if you're just living a life that feels good to you, and people forgive you for that, I think there's a lot of external judgment. Yeah, for like sure. Like people evaluating other people by their own standards of like, 
you know, what well, it's all I don't want to be an illustrator, and she wants to be an illustrator, so she's an idiot. But I think you have to, like, allow... I, I can feel a lot of parents who are like, well, they, they were into something else, and now they're yes. changing. And they're not... They Heaven have this other passion. They grow. Yeah, they can't change. I think I think we just should be allowed to change. I think that's that's another... I just <laughs> keep going, that's really good. That's really, <laughs> that's really beautiful. We should be allowed to change. And this discussion is important for those being parents right now because the idea of the dream is so prevalent and possible, oh. which is wonderful. <laughs> we are projecting a lot. In fact, not only you're making me realize not only are we doing it to our children, but we're doing it to our friends too. Yeah, for we're sure. all having these ideas. I have to be careful of that. You know, I get really overly excited for people and I want them to, whatever makes them happy, I want them to turn that into something and and it might just be exactly what it is, then that's where it will remain. Right. Good stuff. <laughs> well, is there anything that you feel that you would want to share that I haven't asked or anything that's come to mind? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, we're done. We're done with this. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. It was a lot of fun. It was fun. You guys are the best. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sean. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>